Tuesday, March the 15th, European stocks are down, but at session highs, airline stocks are up, oil stocks are down. The countdown to the next hour of European markets starts right now. From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. So this is what the price action in Europe looks like right now. The stock 600 still down by three tenths of one percent, but well off session lows here earlier. The euro, the pound gaining traction against the dollar. Euro dollar still below 110, 109.83. This in advance of the Fed. We're up by four tenths of one percent. But this is the story of the day. Brent crude sub 100. Kaylee down by 7.3. Yeah, Guy, it's been a monster, monster move for crude. And of course, it's also been a monster move to the downside for tech stocks since the record the Nasdaq 100 hit on November 19th. That saw the index plunging into a bear market from that record high yesterday. But we're getting just the slightest rebound. Of course, when you're down 21 percent, a 2 percent rally or so today only goes so far. But nonetheless, we are in positive territory across the benchmarks here in the U.S. with tech stocks leading the way. The one big laggard on a sector basis, no surprise, energy. Energy is down by about 4.6%. That is everything to do with the declines in oil that you mentioned. WTI, no exception to that. We're trading sub $95 a barrel when we got a taste of 130 at one point last week. And then in the bond market, the action really is unremarkable in comparison. We're down a single basis point on the 10-year Treasury yield, trading at 212 ahead of the Federal Reserve tomorrow, Guy. Katie, let's update everybody on the latest geopolitical events, particularly those around Russia. Within the last hour, we've seen Russia impose sanctions on President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. This as the Prime Ministers of Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia head to Kiev. Uh, we need to figure out exactly what this all means. To do that, we're joined now by Bloomberg's Amory Hordern in Washington and Aggie Cantrell, who is on the border between Ukraine and Poland. Aggie, I'm going to start with you. We have three European leaders heading for Kyiv to meet with President Zelensky. Let's talk about the impact that this trip is going to have and what it signals. I think the significance of this trip, what it signals to Ukraine, can't be overstated. Essentially, three European leaders are going to the capital of, uh, of Ukraine, Kyiv, at the moment where Half of the population of that city has already fled the violence and left the city. I've been speaking to a lot of people on the border here who have come from Kiev in the past several days. And the bombing in the outskirts of Kiev that is a real concern to the government there is continuing to, it's continuing to occur. And we're seeing that these three leaders, when they, when they went, they said that this was going to be a message of solidarity with the Ukrainians, but it was also going to be an effort to present Zelensky's government with a package of support measures on behalf of the whole of the European Union. Well, and Aggie, you talk about the bombing near Kyiv, the capital, but we understand there also have been attacks growing, moving west throughout the country. How is that exacerbating the flow of refugees you are seeing at the border with Poland? So we've already heard that three million refugees have now left the country and a great deal of them have come through the western border into Poland, into Hungary and into other bordering nations. Um, now we're looking at the fact that Poland and other Eastern European nations are really expecting a lot of support from the rest of the EU in this time. Poland itself has already accepted 1.5 million refugees and they're hoping to be able to help integrate these people into their systems, into their education systems, into their labor force. And for that, they're wanting a lot of money. They're wanting the EU uh, recovery fund to be unlocked and to be given to these countries that desperately need it right now. All right, Bloomberg's Aggie Kentrell, great reporting from that border. Thank you so much. Now let's turn to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington. Anne-Marie, the headline just crossed moments ago that Russia is now putting on personal sanctions for President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Is that just a symbolic move? Yes, it is, is purely symbolic. It's a tit-for-tat response on the sanctions the U.S. has placed on President Putin and those close around him. We should note that what these sanctions would actually do is freeze any sort of assets American officials, the United, President of the United States, has in Russia. 
I highly doubt they have any assets in rubles in Russian banks or houses or anything like that. It would also bar entry into Russia. But as I said, this is largely symbolic, but it does um, talk to what is going on right now, which is an absolute escalation of not just the sanctions package, but also what's going on on the ground. Amory, the president is going to be traveling to Europe next week, though. Unlikely, as you say, that he's going to be traveling to Russia. But nevertheless, it looks like he is going to be visiting Brussels. What do we know about that trip? Well, it's likely that the White House wants to make this stance. Having the president go to Europe, and especially Brussels, which is the NATO headquarters, is really just reinforcing that the U.S. is an ally in all of this, and they stand united, arm in arm, with their partners. And throughout this entire situation, whether it was pre-invasion, the U.S. was constantly in contact with the European partners, sharing that intelligence. And then during the sanctions packages, there was days when the Europeans went first, and just an hour later, the U.S. responded. They were in lockstep with how they were going to roll out tranche after tranche of the sanctions we've seen. It'll be interesting to see if the president decides to go to any other uh, areas as well on that trip. Brussels makes a lot of sense in the sense that this is the NATO headquarters, but potentially he can go to some other countries. Eastern Europe right now is potentially some of those countries that I imagine are vying for that visit. Amory Hordert at the White House, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, we're going to look at how investors are assessing the risks that we've just been talking about. about. Mark Dowdy is the CIO of Blue Bay Asset Management. He is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. So our next guest says it's premature to believe that there won't be further escalation in the war in Ukraine. With us now, the Chief Investment Officer of Blue Bay Asset Management, Mark Dowding. Mark, we are getting volatility across the piece right now. Oil, $40 round trip. Uh, you've got Chinese assets being hammered right now. The Nasdaq closing in a bear market. Talk me through whether or not you are seeing this dislocation leading to pockets of opportunity. Is there anywhere you would think about buying the dip right now? So I think it's important to emphasize that in these sorts of markets, there will always be bargains. When you have volatility, there'll always be sort of distress assets that certain investors are needing to sell, which you're picking up at better prices. But I think the answer to your question depends on investment time horizon. Uh, I think if you are taking more of a medium term view, you can look at European stocks and say they're back at where they were at the beginning of 2020. You can say that they look relatively cheap, European banks, I happen to think, are relatively cheap. Um, but if you're more concerned about the short term, I still think that there's going to be more volatility in store in the coming days and weeks. And so uh, it may well be that prices get cheaper before they uh, start going back up again. OK, so more could be in store. Buckle up, everybody. I know that's something that we all love to hear. Mark, speaking about the volatility in oil specifically, the declines that we have seen, I mean, down 20 percent in just five days. Is that to be believed? Yes, yeah, so it's a, a crazy round trip. But I think what you need to sort of understand here is uh, a week ago, uh, we were looking at a, a global economy that looked to be in, uh, in pretty good health. Uh, and we were really surveying the uh, the, the, the picture of a, demo, uh, of a supply shock. We'd taken Russian supply out, and uh, there was a, a concern that uh, where are we going to get on our oil from? And so people I was speaking to this time a week ago were talking about oil going from $120 up to $180. Um, but the, the new news this week, obviously, is that uh, we, we now have uh, evidence of perhaps a, a demand shock. If you end up with Russia, uh, with sorry, China needing to lock down uh, on the wake of a, a COVID scare, you could see a, a material drop in oil demand. Uh, and uh, if that coincides with any sort of breakthrough in, in peace talks and, and, and that leads to uh, uh, sort of um, any easing of sanctions, then you can see how sort of uh, you end up with a, a move uh, back from a, a big shortage into surplus. And so uh, a market like this can be very volatile. But I would say on the Ukraine new news, we would be pretty skeptical that we're going to see any early end to this conflict. We just don't see a proper off ramp for for Putin just yet. And we don't think he's going to want to walk away from uh, uh, this war uh, with his uh, reputation as damaged as it currently is. 
Mark, that's going to have meaningful impacts for various European economies. Uh, we're starting to see, certainly in the loan markets, talk of defaults. We're starting to see maybe that creeping in to some of the high yield space as well. Is this the beginning of a credit cycle in Europe? How do you view the credit markets in this part of the world? So I think the, the, the answer there is very much, uh, do you think that there's a material um, uh, sort of recession risk uh, ahead of us? And, and you look at uh, an indicator like the ZEW survey, which was released this morning. I think we saw the, uh, one of the biggest drops in, uh, in that survey indicator for about 30 years to a level which would be consistent with a move into recession. And so you, you can certainly understand how investors are sort of um, looking at a very uncertain landscape. They're looking at uh, uh, monetary policy needing to tighten in the wake of uh, inflation at the same time, uh, sort of growth forecast being ratcheted lower. Uh, and they have that sort of um, recession fear about them, uh, which obviously would beget um, um, uh, a credit cycle or a pickup in defaults taking place were you to see a recession of that nature. Um, but I still think myself, it's probably a bit premature to be sort of getting uh, too carried away with that. Uh, I think that uh, you have to remember that across Europe, um, we've actually been on a journey out of COVID this year. And so the growth outlook before the Russian news hit was actually looking relatively constructive. And actually, I do think there's going to be a big, big fiscal response in Europe to what's happening in terms of the world events going around us. So a complete collapse in growth to me looks very unlikely. And therefore, when you look at sort of um, um, uh, growth uh, this year, next year, I think it remains in positive territory. And therefore, um, credit markets are probably pricing in a bit too much now in terms of default risk. But the one other caveat here is you also have to remember as an investor, at times of uncertainty, you're going to see um, an increase in the um, uh, sort of risk premia. Uh, and I think that this sort of volatility risk premia related to geopolitics is something that has been sort of baked into the cake in the course of the past week. And it's likely to stay with us now for a very long time, because I do think that we've, we've seen something pretty seismic in terms of geopolitics in the, in the last few days. Well, and of course, Mark, China has somewhat of a role to play within that geopolitical consideration. It also obviously is a force when it comes to the global economy. How concerned are you about a slowdown in China specifically and the ramifications of that? Yeah, so here I think it's very much linked to uh, what is happening around uh, COVID. Uh, we had actually hoped on the back of some recent Chinese easing that actually uh, we, we could actually start to see some better numbers coming out of the Chinese economy. Um, but the recent spike in COVID cases, the, the lockdown in Shenzhen, if it's repeated elsewhere, obviously that does represent material downside risk. And we, we've seen COVID cases reach a peak. Now, for those of us who live in the West, we're, we're probably almost living in a bit of a, a post-COVID world. We're, we're, we're trying to think, what on earth is the problem? Why is China still uh, sort of behind the times in trying to uh, adopt a, a zero COVID policy and, and enact lockdowns. But the reality is that uh, obviously in the West, we, we've done a very good job of uh, uh, sort of rolling out vaccines, immunizing our populations, particularly the older and more vulnerable in society. Uh, that hasn't necessarily been the case in, in places like Hong Kong and China. So if you look at the data in terms of, uh, sadly, the, the, the deaths in, in um, Hong Kong that we're seeing spiking coincidentally, along with the spike in COVID cases, uh, I think there's a lot of anxiety in China now that actually, if there is a big wave, yep. it is going to massively stress the healthcare system. So I think it's all, all down to the COVID uh, news. Uh, and, and here it's a, a bit of a tough one to call. The Nasdaq Golden Dragon China Index trying to rally right now. It's actually up around 4.5%. But China Tech, Mark, as we spoke about at the beginning of the conversation, has been battered not only this week, last week, the week before that, for the last year. If you... If, if you're looking at opportunities and you're looking at dislocations, what do you think of China Tech right now? So I think the, the most certainly names that you want to be trying to play and, and buying in China Tech, the, 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 obviously the, the difficulty here is that thematically uh, the crackdown that we've seen from the Communist Party uh, has obviously uh, clobbered a, a number of the names in that sector. So uh, making sure that you're, you're in the right name it is especially important in the context of uh, uh, China tech in terms of the, the clampdown that we've seen on some of the Chinese uh, uh, oligarchy. Um, uh, and so uh, that coupled to uh, uh, pressure on the uh, US, uh, pressure to, to delist uh, companies out of the, uh, the US market uh, on top of uh, uh, worries pertaining to, to China and things like COVID, is a bit of a perfect storm at the moment for, 
uh, I think when you survey the, the landscape and you look at historic valuations, if you're able to sort of um, uh, access uh, at stocks at levels that they were trading three or four years ago, um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are certainly some bargains to be had. Where else would there be bargains in emerging markets, Mark? Well, I, I think it's um, uh, something that we, we potentially see all over the place. We, we've seen a, a lot of dislocated price action. So whether you're looking at sort of uh, uh, credit markets where uh, actually uh, emerging market credit spreads, we, we thought look uh, fully priced towards the end of last year, uh, you've, uh, you've seen something like the, uh, the emerging market um, sort of bond index move from a spread of 330 basis points out to 500 basis points. Um, you're, you're now looking at sort of levels uh, there where uh, there are names which are cheap. Uh, sovereign credit is, uh, is probably worth owning. There are a lot of investment grade names, be it um, sort of uh, euro denominated securities from countries as far apart as Mexico or Romania, which we think would look cheap. There, there are bargains to be had in emerging market corporate bonds as well. Uh, so I think it's all about sort of stock picking, issue picking, uh, picking the right sectors, the right uh, countries to be invested in, uh, because um, uh, it's, it's certainly a, a time uh, when you can sort of pick up uh, uh, good bargains in, in the midst of these sort of challenging markets. All right, my, Mark Dowding of Blueberry Asset Management, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your thoughts today. And of course, Guy, Mark was talking to us about whether or not there's a real chance of recession in Europe, what the growth picture looks like there. We are hearing from the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, who is speaking at an event in Berlin. She once again kind of repeating the message we got from her last week after that ECB decision, saying they will take whatever action is needed for price stability. The economy should still grow robustly in 2022, but that uncertainty surrounding the outcome look has increased and guy I would imagine we're going to hear some similar kind of tone out of Jerome Powell when he takes the podium tomorrow. Absolutely, but I think we're going to get more clarity out of Powell. I think a lot of people were caught by surprise by the hawkishness coming out of Christine Lagarde or more broadly the governing council last week. Uh, it was interesting, uh, I think it was the FT reporting this, one of the, uh, the members or, or one of those close to the members saying we can't be the only central bank that do, does nothing here. Uh, you just wonder whether there's a sense of kind of FOMO is the wrong word, but yeah. looking isolated at this point when the Fed is going to be on track to deliver rate hikes, looks like the Bank of England's going to do the same thing. Yeah, when everyone else is tightening, maybe that's just something that you can't sit out. So we will continue to monitor those headlines from Christine Lagarde. But coming up, we're also going to talk about another story. It's going to be more expensive to buy a Tesla. Elon Musk says the company is also getting hit by inflation. We'll have more on what exactly that means next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. A social communications platform for gamers, Discord, is talking to investment bankers about going public this year. Bloomberg has learned that Discord is considering a direct listing. The company was last valued by private investors at about $15 billion. It's the start of Europe's ambitious effort to lure global chip makers back to the continent. Intel will invest $18.7 billion to build a cutting-edge semiconductor production site over in Germany. The company will try to make chips smaller than 2 nanometers, something that hasn't been done yet. And that is your latest Business Flash. Guy. Rudika, thank you very much indeed. Uh, joining us now for more on Intel's plans for that mega factory uh, in Germany is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Um, Ed, let's talk a little bit about this. We've seen the huge investment that yeah. Intel is going to make in Ohio. Um, is this of comparable scale? Uh, is it going to be making the same thing? Should we think about that investment into Germany in the same terms as the Ohio investment that has been made a little while ago? Yeah, it's really case in point of where the semiconductor industry is right now, because it's an eye-watering figure, right? $19 billion, 17 billion euros just for the Germany part of it, $33 billion across Europe. Because when you build a fab, you need also, you know, the associated supply chain, warehouse, design labs that come with it. But the devil's in the detail, and it's a, it's a plant that doesn't come online until 2027. And, you know, it's really for Intel's next generation of technology, sub-2 nanometer chips they're not they're not at that level they're not currently manufacturing semiconductors 
smaller than two nanometers. So, you know, what we're seeing across the industry is just tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of pledges to increase capacity in key markets. But it's very distant because it takes a very long time to build what is essentially the highest tech factory you can build. Well, and Ed, obviously, consumers of these chips would like them to be built as fast as possible right. for that compa capacity to be ramped up as fast as possible, including the auto industry. That is one challenge that Tesla has been dealing with is a shortage of semiconductors, but also just higher metals prices, higher costs that then they are now saying are going to pass through to the end consumer. Talk to us about the price hikes for its vehicles that Tesla is planning. Yeah, so, so Tesla's cheapest model, the cheapest Model 3, is now $46,990 U.S. dollars. And this is the second price hike this month that Tesla's made. And, we, you know, we're really focused on the inflation story right now, the raw materials, the commodity story. But the other side of this for Tesla, don't forget, is that they're in the driving seat, pardon the pun, that demand for their products is so great, and they are so supply-constrained anyway in the number of vehicles they're able to build, that you know, they are able to adjust pricing. The street wants them to adjust pricing. You know, there, there's this great obsession with Tesla's volume, the number of vehicles it sells, but investors have also been very focused on gross margins. And if you look at the chart of Tesla's gross margins, we're talking 30%, which the rest of the industry just doesn't hit. Yep. And if you go back through the earnings statements and the, the transcripts of the earnings calls, they zero in on this idea of protecting margins. So raising prices with this inflationary background yep. is very much a margin story as well. Ed, can we expect this to be repeated elsewhere? Are other car makers going to be raising prices yeah. in the near future? 100%. GM's already raised you know, prices on its premium SUVs by $1,000 in the last month. They're less nimble than Tesla. They feel the headwind more strongly um, in terms of those quantities costs. Tesla has long-term supply contracts, right? It has visibility. And yeah. the question that we have, and we don't know, is what visibility to for GM, VW have on those components' costs. All right, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thank you so much for joining us. And, of course, feeding into that Tesla story is higher metals prices. It all feeds into what we're seeing in the commodity complex. What we're seeing in crude, though, is really something. That rally has absolutely deflated down more than 20 percent in just five days in what has been a tumultuous week of trading, to say the least. We'll discuss with Saxo Bank's head of commodity strategy, Oli Slav Hansen, next. This is Bloomberg. So the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is going to meet with the leaders of Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE in a push for the region to produce more oil. He says the trip is part of an effort to wean Europe off Russian energy. After what Putin has done in Ukraine, you're seeing European colleagues step up to the plate and say, right, this is the time we've got to learn our lesson as the West. We've got to end that dependency on Russian hydrocarbons. And that's one of the reasons I'm going out to the Gulf. Let's talk about what's happening in the crude market right now. It has been something of a roller coaster over the last few days. Oli Sloth Hansen, head of commodity strategy at Saxo, joins us now. Oli, let's just talk about the price action that we've seen. Oil prices rallying hard and then selling off aggressively. A $40 round trip. Does the oil market have any idea right now how to price a barrel of oil? I think the price action speaks for itself, uh, Guy. Uh, clearly not. Last week, the market rallied in on the expectation that supply was going to be, uh, be, be uh, capped. Uh, but without actually seeing any supply disruption. Since then, uh, focus has moved to the FOMC tomorrow, the COVID outbreak in China. But I think we just need to look at the, uh, the, the deep discount with which uh, Russian oil is still trading in the market and just, uh, just see that uh, the market is, is still at risk of being undersupplied over the coming weeks. So uh, I think we are probably near a, a low here in the market. So you would expect us to move back above $100 a barrel? I think in the short term there is a risk of that. As long as the war, actually, war continues, as long as the, there's self-sanctioning going on in the market, and as long as we don't see a, a significant reduction in demand, uh, then I think the risk is uh, for, for renewed upside. But obviously, one thing is what's happening in China right now, which will take some barrels off the market. I think another thing is the, the shock to the system from these very, very high diesel prices last week, because I think we, we, we're all focusing on oil prices 
and where the uh, where the demand destruction level is, that's really irrelevant because what counts is that what we are buying as consumers, we're buying gasoline, diesel and jet fuel and heating oil and so on. And diesel last week just hit levels which sent a, a shiver through the market and I think already has started to have an impact on, on demand. So uh, we're probably seeing that accumulation over the coming months. But uh, for now, the uh, the upside risk is still there. Boris Johnson's going to go to the Gulf. He's going to go to Riyadh. He's going to go to Abu Dhabi. He's going to ask for more oil. Do you think anybody's going to listen? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so. Um, we just saw the OPEC's uh, monthly oil market report out today. Again, they, they're trying to skip the elephant in the room, not really talking about war and invasion, uh, still saying the market is adequately supplied, but also saying there's a higher degree of uncertainty uh, going ahead. So I think at this point, uh, we're probably not going to uh, expect any additional barrels. And also, I think the main risk or the main problem still is the, the lack, of, uh, lack of many countries actually reaching their, their quota levels. Uh, that has left the market already before the war action started pretty tight. And, uh, and that's, that's where we need to see improvement. So far, we haven't. What about Iran, Oli? There's been some confusion as to whether or not a nuclear deal may or may not be on the table in the near future. What impact would you expect that to have within the market? Well, if you do get uh, a deal, then uh, potentially we could see, uh, I would say, in the region of a million barrels coming back to the market. Probably also uh, quite a lot of oil stores uh, on and offshore that could be unleashed into the market. So that would obviously help uh, the uh, the global global balance and also alleviate some of the pressures from the lack of Russian oil right now. But uh, at this point, there's so many so there's so many political aspects in this. We have got Russia on one side, we have got Saudi Arabia on the other side, and then we got U.S. obviously desperate for additional barrels. So uh, this seems yeah. like a, a process that's still yeah. going to drag out. There was a headline that crossed a little bit earlier on, a Dow Jones headline, suggesting that the Saudis are thinking about pricing crude in the Chinese currency, a huge departure from pricing in dollars. What are the implications of that? Do you think it's likely and over what sort of time frame? I think it's very likely and, and I think it just goes to uh, show the, uh, the, how many countries are increasingly want to uh, move away from the dollar. And uh, considering Saudi Arabia, China's... Uh, is, uh, accounts for 25% uh, of the uh, Saudi oil sales. So obviously they are big customer. And if big customers uh, want something, then normally they get it. So, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, some, some kind of pri new pricing mechanism emerge over the coming, coming weeks and months. All right, Ollie. so we've talked a lot about the oil market. What about the metals? Had metals gotten you know, quite as overheated, maybe mispriced, unsure how to price it as we've seen in oil? Well, nickel for, for sure, um, yeah. and it's going to be very, very interesting to see how that market uh, uh, will even try to reopen tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be a, a long while before we get some normalization there, but, uh, but some of the other markets uh, will, be, will continue to be, be, uh, be, be bid up. Uh, aluminium, due to a very high energy cost, it is the most energy intensive metal to produce. I think also, even though we, we are looking for an economic slowdown over the coming months as the Fed starts to hike rates, we have to remember that the uh, the, the, the decarbonisation process, the, the the move away from fossil fuels, and the now the, also the increased defence spending will leave uh, increased uh, demand or will leave uh, quite a solid demand for metals over the coming coming quarters and years. So uh, I, I say I think that we are still going to see a, a future with elevated metal prices. But again, some of the if you look at the charts of some of these markets, uh, Brent crude has returned to trend. Uh, some of the other metals uh, also has come down. So, uh, so with that in mind, uh, I think we are fairly close to some, uh, some support levels here. What are the implications of that, Oli? We just, we just talked to our correspondent in San Francisco, Ed Ludlow, talking about the fact that Tesla's just raised prices again. Battery prices are going up massively. How do we manage the transition to the, to the newer economy with cleaner energy if the price of this stuff is going to go higher and stay higher, how inflationary do you think the energy transition is going to be with these kinds of inputs? It will be inflationary and it will last for longer and it also raises the prospect for, for the uh, rate hikes uh, from now starting probably tomorrow from the FMC, not having the, the desired impact uh, bringing inflation down because it is an input pressure. But you can also argue that if the, 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 the uh, automobile industry is under pressure, uh, metal prices has, has uh, raised higher, probably twice as much for the EVs than for the, uh, for the standard cars. 
given the uh, the surge we've seen in some of the battery uh, me related metals. But uh, but overall, uh, again, the 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 uh, but the political will to uh, to uh, at least here in Europe, uh, following what's happened in Russia, to to wean ourselves off the dependency of Russian oil and gas probably is a price that uh, many feel at this point is worth paying. And uh, again, also adding to the uh, to the increased uh, cost towards defense, uh, which will also add some some demand. So the conclusion is it will just it will be very expensive and we will be facing a market where demand will remain robust, but it, the, but supply will remain inelastic and that will keep the prices underpinned. All right. So all of that feeding back into inflation. Let's talk about one metal, not an industrial one, but a precious one that maybe could be an inflation hedge. How are you looking at gold right now, Ollie? Well, I, unfortunately, I called it the low volatility safe haven last week. Uh, that was a little, that was like 24 four hours too early uh, <laughs> because since then we, we obviously seen quite a big uh, correction there as well. But uh, oil, no, sorry, gold is, is uh, responding to a very, very strong build up in speculative interest uh, within the last few, four weeks. And uh, with that in mind, uh, a lot of some of these uh, short term momentum traders, they have been forced to uh, step back or out of the market. I do note that uh, holdings in ETFs has continued to rise this past week, even though uh, prices co had come down. And that tells me that we're still seeing maybe a geopolitical uh, risk premium that's coming out of the market, but the stagflation uh, risk is still there. And I think that's still one that will provide some underlying support for, for precious metals over the coming months. All right, Oli Sloth Hansen, head of commodity strategy at Saxo, Saxo Bank. Thank you so much for joining us for his take on the incredible price action we are seeing in commodities. But also we have to note the equity action today, Guy, because now the stock Amazing. 600 is flat, little changed on the day after being deeply, deeply lower at one point in the session. And after plunging into a bear market yesterday, the Nasdaq 100 up 2.6%. Dip buyers, not dead. This was a debate we had first thing this morning, <laughs> Kelly is. and I. We sort of came in, we're trying to figure out what the question of the day is going to be. And, and the first one we came up with was, is buying the dip dead? Turns out that may have been maybe the question not to go for. I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> I am also glad we didn't. But I wonder what exactly equities are reacting to. Is this just an opportunity to buy the dip? You're not seeing much movement in the bond market. Yields are essentially flat as we see equities yep. here in the U.S. around session high. So maybe is this part oil. of the oil story with the plunge we are yeah. seeing in oil? We asked our actual question of the day earlier. Is the oil crash a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe the market is seeing it as a good thing. Well, certainly for now. For now. The demand story out of China may be something that we maybe reflect on uh, over a little longer time frame. But yeah, no, I think it's oil. Oil oil down this much. You look at what has happened. So the airline bosses are all in New York now. They're at this yeah. JP Morgan conference. They're sounding really positive right now. U.S. carriers don't hedge. Lower oil price, really good news. I, on both sides of the Atlantic, airline stocks are up really quite nicely today. Yeah, you are definitely seeing that reflected. The likes of United, for example, right now is up 9% in the U.S. equity session. So we will continue to keep an eye on the moves in oil, but we also have to continue another part of our commodities conversation. Look at metals and the nickel frenzy and the London Metal Exchange's plan to resume trading it tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Reshma Sojani, the founder of Girls Who Code. That's at Bloomberg Technology at 5.30 p.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Ritika Gupta. The UK has imposed new sanctions on Russia and Belarus, along with its G7 allies. Britain is banning the export of luxury goods to the two nations. It's also revoking their most favoured nation status. That means hundreds of products from Russia and Belarus will face an additional 35% tariff. Lockdowns aimed at stemming the spread of the coronavirus in China are disrupting the operations of a number of businesses. Apple supplier Honhai is stopping production at all its, its sites in Shenzhen. Toyota and Volkswagen also have halted output at several factories. The lockdowns affect more than 45 million people. And a year after, a giant container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal and disrupted trade for months. Another evergreen marine ship has run aground. This time, the Ever Forward got stranded in the Chesapeake Bay after leaving the port of Baltimore. Authorities say the ship's grounding is not blocking other vessels. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy.
Ritika, thank you very much indeed. So, big day tomorrow. Trading in nickel will resume on the London Metal Exchange. A week ago, of course, it was suspended when the price of nickel soared uh, to more than $100,000 a tonne, setting off a historic short squeeze. Uh, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Mark, Barton to t Mark Burton sorry, to talk <laughs> about that. Blast in the past. Um, Mark, let's just talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the story tomorrow. So... It's been closed for a week, the nickel market. Since then, commodities largely have come down and down very sharply. We've been talking about crude. Let's focus on what we think is going to happen tomorrow. What is your best guess? What on earth is this market going to look like when it reopens? Um, hi. Uh, so I think the, um, speaking to traders, the main thing that people are looking at um, is, A, the, the broad move lower in commodities markets over the past week, um, but also trading has continued in the Shanghai nickel market and um, prices on the Shanghai futures exchange are substantially lower uh, on a like-for-like -like basis. It's uh, in the order of $20,000 a tonne lower uh, than the, the closing price of mm. uh, uh, a sort of 48,000 um, in the LME market. Uh, so the expectation on the balance of probabilities is that um, from the traders I've been speaking to that prices uh, are likely to fall. Um, but it's not a given. Uh, the, the, the conditions that led to this rally on, in the London market to some extent are still there, yeah. uh, as we have reported, um, uh, Ching Shan still has this dominant short position that needs to be covered at some point under some circumstances. It has uh, breathing room uh, and it's, uh, it, the immediate pressure to cover it, uh, it is unlikely to be as uh, as uh, pressing as uh, as it was over over Monday and Tuesday, but. Yeah it's still likely to be a very volatile trading session and um, okay. and fundamentally the market is is still quite tight so uh so mark balance of probabilities says a, says a drop how can the lme be confident what happened last week won't happen again what steps has it taken in the interim so i think one key uh sort of bulwark against uh a, a repeat of Tuesday's drama is that it's imposed quite narrow intraday trading limits uh, of, in the case of nickel, five percent either way, and so that gives um, <clears throat> that gives everyone in the London market uh, a bit more confidence that when uh, when trading does resume, uh, they won't be exposed to that kind of um, colossal rise that we saw on both yep. on both Monday and Tuesday of last week. Mark, how damaged is the LME by this whole story? Well, we've seen a lot of commentary from the, uh, the, the um, financial industry uh, where there is uh, a, a lot of grievance over the decision, N not, not so much to close the market, because I think everyone understands the, the circumstances that led them to that point, but the decision to cancel the trades that had taken place on uh, Tuesday morning of last week has caused uh, a lot of consternation among, uh, among investors. And I think that that, that could cause them lasting lasting damage really i mean it's the the we're right in the middle of a red hot bull market for commodities and to have investors uh, big macro type uh, funds that would presumably ordinarily be piling into markets like the lme expressing reservations about doing so is yeah. damaging in and of itself how long that lasts and how uh, how severely they follow through with their words, with uh, actions, cutting their yeah. exposure to the LME, it remains to be seen. But on, on the face of it so far, it looks like a significant problem for the LME. All right, Mark, we have to leave it there. But I think we all are looking forward to seeing how this trade goes when it reopens tomorrow at 8 a.m. London time, I believe. Thank you so much for joining us, Bloomberg's Mark Burton. Now coming up, we'll look at other markets as well because, of course, we have oil plunging to the downside today, down the better part of 8% on WTI. That is giving a lift to equities. The Nasdaq 100 up 2.5% after falling into bear market territory yesterday. But I also want to point out what that is doing to inflation expectations, at least priced by the U.S. bond market. The U.S. two-year break-even down 16 basis points today, though at a still elevated 4 in 
and a half percent. Of course, that sets the scene for the Federal Reserve's decision tomorrow. 25 basis points essentially baked in. But how does the Fed look at what we're seeing today and how may that influence what the guidance looks like going forward? We'll have more on that in just a moment. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about what we're going to be looking at here at Bloomberg over the next 24 hours. The main event, of course, is that we've got the Fed kicking off its two-day meeting. Uh, it is going to conclude tomorrow. President Biden uh, will also be in action signing the bill to fund the government until September the 30th. Tomorrow, though, the focus very much on the Fed, Kayleigh. That will be by far and away the main event. Absolutely. That meeting will end. They will make their decision, likely going to be a 25 basis point rate hike, but we'll really be paying attention to Jerome Powell's press conference, that dot plot, everything about the guidance going forward. Also tomorrow, President Zelensky's virtual address before U.S. Congress uh, will happen and an extraordinary meeting of NATO defense ministers. Of course, the war in Ukraine front and center on the agenda. That also a factor that the Federal Reserve has to consider. So let's get more insight into the Fed's meeting. Bloomberg's Michael McKee is joining us now. All right, Mike, give us the rundown of what exactly we should expect. You just Come did. On. Well, there Basically, we go. Basically, <laughs> it's all kind of tied together, the war <laughs> and oil prices and everything else. Uh, the Fed has to try to figure out where the economy is going. It's going to be a very difficult job. Now, we know going in that the first thing they're going to do is tell us that they raised interest rates by 25 basis points. They told us they were going to do that, and they will follow through. Then the question is, what are their new economic projections? Obviously, they have to raise their inflation forecast. But you look at oil prices today, the big jump up, and now prices are below where they were at the beginning of March. So that would signify inflation going down. How do they account for that? Can they come up with any kind of reasonable number? And then, of course, Chairman Jay Powell gets the hot seat. He gets to try to explain it all. The thing that we are going to be looking at is the dot plot, because that's yep. going to give us an idea of what the Fed is going to be doing going forward. The market had priced lower than the Fed at their January or December 15th meeting, but now the market thinks rates are going to go much higher than the Fed. So what's the dot plot going to tell us? And then, as Kaylee said, yep. after tomorrow, risks ahead. You know, how do we know what's going to happen next? Mike, yeah. what about the balance sheet? I haven't heard a lot about the balance sheet recently. Are we going to hear about the balance sheet tomorrow? Uh, probably not. Um, they may reference it in the sense that they talked about it and then they're going to make a decision in the coming months. But they definitely want to separate raising interest rates from so shrinking the balance sheet. They want them to be to seen as two different things and they want to see the balance sheet as a sort of uh, automatic withdrawal of liquidity, whereas uh, raising interest rates is an optional decision once uh, they come to each meeting. Mike, we'll look forward to your coverage. We'll look forward to your question. Bloomberg's Mike McKee on the Fed tomorrow. Some fantastic coverage coming up. Uh, I just want to point out that Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, is making some comments right now. Kiev, not serious, he says, to find a mutually acceptable solution. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the latest we have in terms of the reporting from Ukraine and the border there. That will be coming up on Bloomberg's The Cable Show. Uh, it's on Bloomberg Radio. It starts at the top of, uh, not in the next hour, but the hour after that, because we've only got four hours between New York and London, 5 p.m. here in London, Kayleigh, on Bloomberg DAB Digital Radio. We've also got something else coming up a little bit later on today, which I'm equally as excited about. <laughs> it kicks off today. It's the crypto show. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for it for a long time here at Bloomberg. Matt Miller's excited. Kay Kaylee's very excited. What are we going to get? What, what should we be expecting here? Well, it's 30 minutes all dedicated to crypto, debuting today at 1 p.m. New York time, Guy. Our first guest, Mike Novogratz, the billionaire crypto investor who heads up Galaxy Digital. He'll be talking to us the entire half hour. There is so much to unpack. We have to talk about the role crypto plays in the current war in Ukraine, how it factors into sanctions. Does this accelerate the de-dollarization of the world? We'll also dig into some of his specific investment opportunities he's looking at, his targets for uh, where some of these individual cryptocurrencies may be going over the next year, even the next five years, digging us up in the culture around crypto as well. It will be a wide-ranging conversation. Of course, this is just episode one. Will take place every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So really looking forward to that later. But coming up first, KKR's head of global macro and asset allocation, Henry McVeigh, will be joining Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. 
From New York and London, this is Bloomberg.